The criteria of submission is agreement with God. Dr. Tony Evans says even though a man should earn his wife's respect, godly obedience is the reason she should give it to him. There are a lot of people in life you do not like who you must respect, and your husband is to be chief among them. You are respecting him because of his position. This is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. Regardless of what the world says, there's something a man needs from his wife more than sex. Let's join Dr. Evans as he tells us what that is and offers specific advice on how wives can strengthen their husbands by providing it. God established the family, as you know, and he established guidelines for that covenant. And marriage is called a covenant. It's called a binding relationship between a male and female that is a until death do you part relationship. That's what it is. The only reason God even allowed divorce under certain limited and most restricted scenarios is because of the sinfulness of men, according to Deuteronomy 24 compared with Matthew 19, the sinfulness of men, God had to come up with a way to protect men and women from each other. But God's idea of relationships is that there would be no divorce except under the restricted scenarios of adultery and or desertion, that those would be the only two categories. When God wanted to make sure that his rules were operating in history, in time, he set up a chain of command. That chain of command is listed for us, and I'll read it to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where it says, verse 3, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of a woman, and Christ is the head of God. Now, that's in the text. That's what the Bible says. That there is, in history, a chain of command, and that chain of command is also in eternity. For example, God is the head of Christ. Now, Christ is equal to God in essence, but Christ is not equal to God in function. And a fundamental difference that you and I must understand is that there is a difference between function and essence. Essence, everybody's equal. Function, everybody's not equal. There must be different functions if a job is to be carried out. Now you see this in your employment. In your employment, there's an owner, and then there's a, the CEO, the person who manages it, and then there's middle level management, and then there's the more generic personnel. Now if everybody's CEO, the work doesn't get done. But if there is no CEO, then the work doesn't get directed. If there is no owner, there is no business for anybody to be employed in. Each one of those levels is an essential part of fulfilling a job. And Unless there is a chain of command, then everything is up for grabs. Now let me explain before I get into the specifics the purpose of the chain of command. The purpose of the chain of command is to fulfill the wishes of the owner. The reality is when you own it, you can do what you want to do because it's yours, okay? Nobody else can come into my house and tell me how to furnish it. They can tell me what they think about how I furnished it, but they have no authority in terms of the essence of how I furnished my house because it's my house. With ownership comes certain rights. Well, God is owner. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all they that dwell in it. He owns it. And quite frankly, he's not asking for advice. Isaiah 40 says, And of whom hath the Lord sought counsel? And from whom did he seek advice? So the Lord isn't really asking for advice. You can give it to him if you want to. But 
just want you to know, he's not going around looking for advice because he knows how he wants his world run. And so what God has done is established institutions designed to carry out his program. And each institution has a hierarchy. The first institution is the family, and the hierarchy is husband, wife, children. All three are equal in essence, but all three are different in function. He has the church, and in the church he has a hierarchy. He has a system. He has elders. He has deacons. has a teacher. All of that is designed to assure that God's plan in history is accomplished. And then government. The Bible says pray for kings, and then Romans 13 says because they are the ministers of God. The job of government is to carry out justice in society. All based on hierarchy. But our concern is the home. We've already established that the husband is the CEO. If he fails that job, then he has done great damage to the cause of Christ. While it does not excuse men for not being men, that is, a man cannot look at his wife and say, because of her, I can't be a man. Because manhood is not related to how another person treats you. It is related to who you are by God's creation. We must go one step and say that many women make it exceedingly difficult for men to assume with ease their God-given responsibility. You see, we live in a world, ladies, where men in general, increasingly, and minority men in particular, are beaten up daily by an unjust society. But in the Bible, the understanding was, no matter what happened in the society at large, when he came home, it was a different story. When the man walked in the door, there was one place everybody knew who he was. There was one place where there was no confusion or lack of clarity that there was one realm the man could lead and be recognized as leader. And that was his home. In the Bible, the concept is called the patriarch. And the patriarch was the man who headed the home and all of the people under the home in such a way that everybody in the home revered his role, thus leading to the concept of respect. There is no command in the Bible for a woman to love her husband. It does not exist. There are verses in the Bible that talk about women loving their husbands, but there is no command for a woman to love her husband. But there are plenty of commands for a, for a husband to love his wife. Now there's a reason for that. A man's greatest need isn't love. Now all men need love, but that's not his greatest need. A man's greatest need is for reverence. Now you may not like that, because it's sure quiet in here. You may not want that, but I'm sorry, that's the way it is. Men go great lengths to be reverenced. They don't necessarily go great lengths to be loved, but they go great lengths to be reverenced. When men put notches on their perennial belts for all the women that they have conquered, it is a desire to be reverenced. It is the desire to come across as Mr. Superstud, who has had this ability to conquer all these women. It is a self-attempt to inflate one's own ego, even though most of those stories are lies. They are attempts to embellish a God-given need for dominion. 
when men say to their wives, who do you think you're talking to? When they're angry, or perhaps when they're not. It is out of a sense that I am not being respected. And I don't know how many men I have talked to who say this. Women generally say, my husband doesn't love me. That's generally how it comes, and that's how it was built to come. But men don't generally say that. Men generally say, my wife doesn't respect me. Because the need of a man given by God is not primarily for love. The need of a man is for reverence. Now, some of you are ticked off already, and I haven't even got to the verse. <laughs> because your attitude is, I'm not reverencing no man. Okay? But you don't want that same response if he were to say, I'm not loving no woman. You see, it is a mutual meeting of needs. So let's look at 1 Peter 3 before I get in more trouble. And so that you know that God is speaking here. In the same way, you wives, and of course, if you're not married, you need to develop a mindset for marriage with this in mind. Be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they're not living like they ought to be living, they may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives. Now when the text opens up with in the same way, that means that it's talking about something that's gone previous. And at the end of chapter 2, what you find is that Jesus Christ suffered unjustly, verse 22, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul in the same way. We'll learn why people who have trouble with the idea of biblical submission usually don't understand what the term really means when Dr. Evans continues this message from his brand new compilation, Marriage Matters. This 14-lesson collection takes an in-depth look at God's blueprint for husbands and wives and what couples are intended to accomplish for the kingdom. Along the way, you'll learn how to break down communication barriers, rekindle romance, and solve problems that are so serious they become strongholds. Because this information is so important, we're offering all seven CDs in Volume 2 of this collection as our gift when you make any contribution, large or small, toward Tony's ministry. But this special offer ends on Friday, so call us at 1-800-800-3222 or visit TonyEvans.org today to get your copy of Marriage Matters. Again, that's TonyEvans.org. Well, Tony will come back with more of today's lesson after this preview of the brand new book he'll be releasing next week. Turning on the news or reading the headlines can leave us with a lot of questions. Why? What do I do? Where is God in all of this? It's these hard questions that bring us to our knees. Prayer is the God-given communication link between heaven and earth if we know how to pray. In Tony's upcoming book, Kingdom Prayer, he'll challenge you to tap into the power and authority you have in prayer and motivate you to utilize your access to our Heavenly Father. Pre-order your copy of Kingdom Prayer by October 3rd, and it'll come to you with some incredible free extras for you, your small group, or church, like free downloads of Tony's book, America, Turning a Nation to God, the classic Answers to Prayer by Andrew Murray, and more. Get details now at TonyEvans.org. If you believe in the power of prayer, don't make it an afterthought. Pre-order Kingdom Prayer today at TonyEvans.org. The comparison to wives in chapter 3 is drawn from the illustration of Christ in chapter 2. And in chapter 2 it says Jesus didn't do anything wrong. He was the ideal spokesman for God, but in spite of that fact, he got nailed to the cross. 
In spite of that fact, he was treated unjustly. In spite of that fact, he was treated miserably. But rather than arguing his point, it says he entrusted himself into the hands of the one who would do right. And then the Bible says, even though you were straying, you have now returned to the shepherd and bishop of your soul. In other words, you are in this building today because God got a hold of you and you've begun responding properly to Christ on some level in the same way ye was. Be submissive to your own husbands. Now, there are two concepts there that create an immediate problem. The first concept is the concept of submissiveness. But before you judge it, understand it. The concept of submissiveness is not a concept of being a doormat or being a floor cloth. It is not saying, uh, let your husband beat up on you. That's not the concept of biblical submissiveness. Let me give you the concept of submissiveness. Submissiveness means placing oneself willingly under the authority of another in keeping with the ultimate responsibility you have under Christ. So submission does mean placing oneself under someone's authority, but submission has limits. In other words, you are submitted to the Lord. First, uh, Ephesians 5 says, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. So submission is to your husband, but the husband has limitations. It must be as unto the Lord. In other words, you do not submit to anything that requires you to disobey God just because your husband wants you to do it. But on the other hand, you do submit to everything that is not contradictory to that which is in keeping with obeying the Lord. If the husband said rob a bank, you say no. You say no, because that would disagree with the Lord. So the criteria of submission is agreement with God. But the responsibility, other than that, is comprehensive. Now he says, submission to your own husbands. Now he's assuming you're married. And by the way, single ladies, just a, a tip so, for you to, to, to clear up so you don't spend 50 years of frustrated life. Don't marry somebody you don't feel like you can submit to. If you are a strong woman, then please marry a stronger man because it's a miserable combination if you are stronger than your husband, okay? Because he's going to be frustrated because he's too weak to lead you, but you're going to be frustrated because you're having to lead him. So they're going to be a perpetual fight. So based on your temperament, always marry somebody you can look up to, not only physiologically, but attitudinally and mentally. You are to submit, place yourself under the authority of your husband. Now, if your attitude, lady, is I am not placing myself under any man, you need to stay single. I mean, you have that right, single. But you don't have that right, married. Now, I know a lot of you ladies don't like your male bosses. You don't like the way they treat you. You don't like the way they talk to you. You don't like the way they dump work on you. You don't like any of that stuff. But when they show up, it's still Mr. So-and-so. He still gets treated with a modicum of dignity. Now, why does he get treated that way? He doesn't get treated that way because he has earned it. It's just the opposite. He gets treated that way because of his position, which leads me to the next line. Even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. The issue of respect has nothing to do ultimately with the success or failure of your husband in his job. This you must understand. You are respecting him because of his position. There are a lot of people that you don't like who you must respect. 
There are a lot of policemen you may not like, but you better respect him. When you go into a courtroom, you don't have to like the judge, but you better respect him. Say the wrong thing and you'll be slapped with contempt of court. Because sitting behind that bench is not only a male, but a male with a robe on who occupies a position. And what you respect, even if you do not like the person, is the position as long as they hold that position. Now, don't get me wrong, the judge is not better than you, the police is not better than you, your boss is not better than you, you're not respecting them out of betterness, you're respecting them out of position. There are a lot of people in life you do not like who you must respect, and your husband is to be chief among them. This is not an option. The Bible says even if he is not living up to his full responsibility, you are obligated unless he causes you to do something against Christ to recognize his position and not disrespect him. And the greatest way that women disrespect their men is with their tongue. <laughs> All right? It is what you say and how you say what you say to the man in your life that is the illustration of your respect. And when you talk to somebody in society who you do not like but must respect, you control yourself. Go try cussing out the local judge and see where it gets you. When the policeman you do not like stops you and you feel like he's been unfair, use profanity against him and get out of the ticket that way. You will find that that does not work for that is not to be tolerated. Or Take your children, mothers. Suppose you give your children instructions that they don't like, and they stand up and say, well, I don't care what you're saying to me, I'm not going to do it. Do we have a problem on our hands? <laughs> we most certainly do. Because even if you were wrong in what you told your children, they must respect your position as mother. Am I right? Well, then, in the same way that those who you don't like are still expected to give respect to you or for them to receive respect from you, the Bible teaches that you are always to recognize your husband's position, even if you disagree with your husband's point. Dr. Tony Evans, talking about a man's number one need. If you'd like to review this lesson on your own or pass it along to a friend, copies are available, and the title to ask about is Respecting Your Man. And don't forget, if you contact us by Friday, it'll come to you as our gift, along with all seven messages in Volume 2 of our current series, Marriage Matters. All we ask is that you include a donation of any size to help keep Tony's teaching on this station. You can make all the arrangements by calling our resource request line at 1-800-800-3222, where staff members are manning the phones day and night. Again, that's 1-800-800-3222. Or just go online and visit TonyEvans.org. While you're there, be sure to take advantage of our special offer on Tony's upcoming book, Kingdom Prayer. Just pre-order it by next Monday, and you'll get it along with that package of free extras you heard about earlier. Don't wait. Get the details today by visiting TonyEvans.org. Well, as we've seen today, a man's self-confidence can be amazingly powerful and surprisingly fragile. Tomorrow, Dr. Evans explains how a well-meaning wife can use that understanding to help her husband move down the road to success. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is made possible by the generous contributions of listeners like you.